It's great to see you. Thank you for being here, and welcome to the um, folks who are joining us remotely as well. My name is Pam Schaff, and I'm the director of the HEAL program, the Humanities, Ethics, Art, and Law program here at Keck School of Medicine. Today's event um, continues the HEAL program's mission of aligning the work of artist patients with the core medical school curriculum. And <clears throat> excuse me, it also serves to um, foster enhanced understanding between patients and future healthcare professionals. Um, today, of course, uh, Ted Meyer, our artist in residence, will will um, be our MC and host, and um, he will introduce our artist. And I want to um, welcome as well Dr. Rao, who we hope will be joining us remotely. Unfortunately, he got called to um, cover another clinic. So he it may be in transit, but he hopes to be able to join us remotely. And he is um, an associate professor of clinical uh, medicine in the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine. So um, we will welcome him in absentia right now, but hope he joins us soon, and I'm going to turn things over to Ted. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to be here without a mask, even though we're 10 feet away. So we're making progress. Um, I'd like to introduce Caroline. So she has been a photographer since, she told me today, eight years old. And she's done a lot of traveling around the world, taking pictures. She had a very uh, expansive palette of places to go, things to photograph, and a lot of that changed as she got pulmonary fibrosis. So for you med students, okay, so if you guys are looking for your, a specialty, uh, according to NIH, about 100,000 people in the U.S. have pulmonary fibrosis and approximately 30 to 40,000 new cases a year. So if you decide to go into this field, there will be patients for you. Worldwide, it affects 13 to 20 out of every 100,000 people. So rare, but not all that rare. Um, so one of the things that was going to be nice about this talk, and hopefully Dr. Rowe shows up, is that it would be the first time we had had an artist and a doctor they had seen. So we were sort of going to throw the HIPAA rules away today to allow them to talk. So hopefully the doctor will be here and give some of his insight. But in the meantime, it's up to Caroline to uh, fill in all the gaps of everything. Um, let's see. So you were diagnosed in 2019, so not that long ago. And you're already discussing maybe getting a lung transplant. Correct. So why don't you start and explain what your first symptoms were, when did you realize things were going wrong, and how long it took you to get to a doctor to find out what was going on? I would say my first symptoms started in about 2016. And the first time I really noticed anything was going up the steps at the Hammer Museum in Westwood. I could barely make it up the steps. And I said to myself, well, I just am not in good shape. I better, you know, start working out some more. But progressively, there were other symptoms. I was coughing a lot. My voice was hoarse, as it is now. And just going from my ground floor of my home upstairs to my bedroom at night became a big effort. So I noticed it. I, I told my primary care doctor about it. And over about a two-year time period, I was given every drug under the sun to do with asthma, COPD. They thought at one point I'd had pneumonia. They were trying everything, and nothing worked. And during that time, I was sent to three different pulmonary specialists, not here yet. And the third one said, I recommend you go to the emergency room right away and get this taken care of, because I was just coughing away at that point. And I said, I, I don't really think it's an emergency. So I went back to my primary care doctor. She referred me to a thoracic surgeon. And a couple months later, I had the lung biopsy that the pulmonary doctor had recommended. And within a few days, that's when I got my diagnosis of pulmonary fibrosis. 
they said to me, the good news is you don't have lung cancer. So how did you get to Dr. Rao? So after I got the diagnosis, I needed to be given medications and I needed to see a pulmonary doctor. I was sent to a doctor in Hawthorne who said, you need to be under care either at USC or UCLA with a teaching program. And I got in touch with my insurance company and they sent me, sent me here and I saw Dr. Rao. And then did he do work on you or did he then send you to even a more specialized person? He sent me to a specialized person within his department and his name was Aria Coffey. And he was excellent. I mean, he even gave me and his other patients his personal cell number so we could call him at any time. Okay. So watching you the last couple of days while we've been setting up for this show, it, I know you have an assistant. You've, a couple of times I've heard you talk about making sure you get your medicines at the right time. You had, an, I guess not an inhaler, but a, something to help you breathe. So why don't you talk a little bit about having this illness and what your daily regimen is to stay alive until you get on that lung transplant list? Altogether, I probably take over 20 different medications and five times a day I'm taking things. So I have to be really on the ball about keeping things scheduled. And so the first thing I do before I eat, I take an omeprazole and that's for acid reflux. And that can be the cause of pulmonary fibrosis. There's a, a lot of different causes and I have idiopathic, which means they don't know the specific cause. But a lot of people who have the disease have that comorbidity. Uh, after a half an hour, then I can eat. And after breakfast, I take about 10 different pills. And the important one I take is called OFEV. And OFEV is one of two drugs that is relatively new that's designed for pulmonary fibrosis and interstitial lung disease. And I take 100 milligrams of it. It's also available in 150 but there are some dire side effects. And then at lunchtime, I take some more medications, and at dinner, some more, and then before bed, some more. But I haven't mentioned the new one I'm taking. So the new one is called Tyveso, and I brought it with me today. My friend Jenny has it there in the black case, and I have to take it four times a day. And I'm up to eight puffs each time I take it, and it's an inhaler. And it's designed for pulmonary hypertension. And I found out when I was going through the tests for the lung transplant that I have 5% pulmonary hypertension. And so my doctor, my pulmonary specialist here, said that, that was very good news, because if I didn't have it, I wouldn't get to be on this drug. And this drug can keep me alive a lot longer. So I've been on it about a month, and I'm noticing some, some good differences. So you're in that position now. You're waiting to find out if you get on the lung list. So have they told you any sort of specifics? Like, I know you have to be at a certain level of discomfort, but not too discomfort. You've got to be healthy and sick at the same time to get on the list. So what, what sort of things have they said to you about getting on the list for a lung transplant? And what's your thought about having to have a lung transplant? Well, there's a sweet spot there because you don't want to be too old or in physical condition that might endanger your life. But you also don't want to be healthy enough that you can get by without the lung transplant. And so the reason they say the the warning about not getting it too early is that there's a 50% chance you may not even make it past five years if you have the lung transplant. I might be better off doing, you know, just going ahead and staying on the medications and eating a healthy diet and doing everything right and foregoing the transplant, at least for now. Okay. So since, since the doctor's not here, there's a couple of questions I'm going to save in case he, he does show up. 
but let's, let's talk about your art career and how it's changed because of your illness. So you used to travel a lot. You took street photography. Um, and if anybody hasn't seen the show yet, it's downstairs in the gallery. And, and we set the gallery up in an unusual way for Caroline, whereas the back wall of the gallery is work pre-onset of illness, and the other walls are after the illness. So the pre-illness wall is some of your travel photos. And if you look at them, they, they are, they're very busy. They're very colorful. You, you don't take like one image in a city as a focal point. You take walls with graffiti and street scenes. Like there's one down there that I'll, I'll show in a bit of a, a woman walking down the street with all the different color buildings in, in Havana. Um, so you, you already had an eye for sort of busyness and things that kind of work in your, your later work. So as you got sick, your, your world had to get smaller. You haven't been able to do a lot of these things. So let's start with um, some of your photos. These were Mexico, right? So why don't you talk no, about... No, no, these are Cuba. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Cuba. These are Cuba. So why don't you talk about sort of what you loved about traveling, the, how it fit into your artwork pre-illness? When I travel, I'm looking at things for the first time, and that freshness really excites me because I, I can see it really without any kind of bias at all. And it's, it's purely visual. In fact, when I, when I have ever gone on a photographic, well, whenever I've gone on a vacation that wasn't designed specifically to be photographic, and I was on a tour, for instance, with a group of people, I would want to just stray from the group and not hear about the history of the place and not know anything about the place. I just want to look at it visually. So in these pictures, I happened to be on a, a trip with about 10 other photographers. And I was only in Cuba for eight days, but it was specifically to take pictures. And being with that group provided a, a kind of safety net because you knew you couldn't get lost and you, you knew nothing was gonna happen to you in a, a place that you didn't know your way around or you didn't know was safe. So when I was walking and I found these images, I got very excited because they had the elements of, of what I love. There's a, a kind of a, a fine art approach to, to the one on the left specifically. Yeah, on your left, it reminded me of a Joseph Cornell the minute I saw it. And Joseph Cornell is a sculptor who I love very much. And so that's, that's what that picture was. And then the, the next one over had all of these colorful textures and people in random spots. And I just thought as a composition, it worked really well. All right, so this is the one I was talking I love this, this shot. So the, even though you have a focal point of this mother and child in the center, there's just so much going on. And that's sort of when we get to your post-illness work, it's also very busy. There's a lot going on. There's a big connection between your pre and post, obviously, because you did it, but the imagery is completely different. So let's talk about this one a little bit. Well, in the streets of Havana, you see people walking down the center of the streets around very colorful buildings that are in many places ruins and are about to drop and fall apart at any time. Yet uh, they, they seem to uh, embrace it and, and so did we. It was just a great feeling to be in a, feeling like you were in a mall in a way, a mall without shops that you could walk around in and you could ride in these little buggies they have, and you could see everything up close. And as you know, even when you're driving in LA versus walking as a pedestrian, you just see so much more when you're on foot. And I, I just love the composition. I like the, the perspective in the shot and the center figures and the colors. Tell us about this grouping of photos. Yeah, this is a series of prints that I did of one 
section or one book that I made about Cuba. I made 10 books and each book had a different theme. So one was color, one was people, uh, one was textures, urban decay was one. And so this is the one with the textures. And I, I am able to see you know, a beautiful composition in itself, but each one of these pictures just shows up close what, what appeals to me, what I like to look for when I'm out shooting. And you also, along with this type of work, you used to do a lot of floral work, flowers and things. So everything that you were really focused on for a while meant leaving the house, observing things and, and photographing them. So um, that'll change. So this is, I, I grabbed this image. She's done a series of pillows that are downstairs. And this is her original image. Oop. And then here's the pillow. So you, you sort of took a bigger image, narrowed it down to a, a specific image that you liked to reproduce in the bigger image, which I think is you know, looking at how your whole life has been lately having to sort of shrink down. It's sort of representational of what's going on with you in general. So. Yeah, the series of, of objects and the new work downstairs is all based upon either photographs I've taken in and around home or at doctor's appointments in parking lots waiting for Ubers to pick me up. And so everything in, in places that I might not naturally go, but am stationed at and start seeing differently. So this series here of the pillows was taken right in front of my dentist's office. And the, the picture that Ted showed right before the pillows is actually a, a wall that had graffiti on it. There were some steps and, can we go back and look at that one? Yeah. When I, when I saw the, the picture on the right, I just got very excited because it had all the elements in it of a picture I like to take, but I wasn't thinking about doing anything else with it other than taking the picture. And actually didn't do much with it until close to the time we were putting on the show. But I, I decided I would isolate parts of it and make these pillows with it. And so each pillow is different because of the way that I zoomed in on the photograph or the way that I blew up the photograph and slightly distorted it maybe or put a picture on top of a picture. And so the pillows are all variations on the theme of the original photograph. All right, so, and this one is printed on a, a plushy blanket downstairs. So just before we talk about this, let's, I wanna talk about as an artist, you, you've done this work, you've traveled around and all of a sudden you, you just can't get on a plane and go. So mentally, I mean, I know how it would, I can't say I know, but I can imagine people in general having their life limited like this, but how did you look at it not just as a, a patient, but as an artist patient thinking, I need to figure out how to keep being creative with these new limitations? It actually was pretty easy for me to deal with the limitations because in anything I find if I have too many options, it, you can get very lost in that and not do anything. So the limitations got me to concentrate on on using the materials I had at hand, using the environment I have, and making the most of what was available to me. Is it a, is it a different process? Because before you would just go out and shoot, and now do you have to plan more ahead? Do you need to set up things? Uh, we're gonna talk about this one, which was a linoleum block print. That was a whole new medium for you. Yes, um, well in this particular series, it actually originated with a rubber, it's, it's actually not linoleum, but it was a line of cut that I made. And I did an online class with LACMA, and that was in the springtime. 
and we had we were all given materials and the, the very first set of prints I made were just tests really I was basically just scribbling and uh, testing out how the colors and the inks worked on the paper and I was very happy with many of them. They're all different. And at the end of the 10-week course, we made books out of these, these prints. And the more I looked at one of them, it reminded me of a patient in a bed. And I certainly didn't plan it that way, but I, I couldn't look at it any other way. And that's where my art changed, because everything I did from then on, I was starting to see these illness-related pictures. And so what I did with the, the print that's on the invitation, that, that was the original line of cut. I then made some objects out of it, such as this blanket. And the blanket itself is different images within the blanket. So you don't see, the, I mean, within the, the original line of cut. And the line of cut's on the, the right side there. So. Yes. That's the line of cut in pink, and then that's the book open up to the second or third page. So is that the first uh, non-photography thing you had done? In a long time. I had gotten my degree in mixed media, and even in design before that at UCLA, so I've worked in a lot of media. But photography has been the main one for me all these years. Okay. So, what I was noticing when we, when we hung the show up is that there's a, a busyness in all your new work. And there's so much going on, they almost look, even though they're real world objects, not microscopic, they sort of look like cells. They sort of look like this frenetic movement, especially this blanket, because you've got several different layers of color and they sort of play with each other. And then I've compared that with some of your, the things you photographed before with sort of a marking system on or, or textures. So I don't know if you have, this is my observation, I don't know if you have anything to say about sort of bringing your old sensibility into the new work. I would say if, it, if it's there, it was unconscious. But I, I love textiles, I love textures. When I've taken pictures, like the one on the left and the right, I think those details have a lot of qualities that resemble textiles. So in that sense, the, the new work and the old work are, are one. Okay. So now, so <laughs> this piece I find sort of funny. Ex explain what you were going for. So when I first saw this, I thought this was cell images, and I thought maybe these were from your lungs or you know, something off a slide or something that had been blown up. But why don't you tell them what it really is and what you were aiming for here? Well, like I mentioned before about taking the picture outside of the dentist's office, this original photo was taken outside of my vestibular therapist's office because I had, I was not able to drive for a year and a half because I was feeling kind of dizzy and spinning and all of that. So I was always waiting for cars to pick me up, standing in parking lots, waiting for hours sometimes because they didn't pick me up on time. So I was looking at things and seeing images that I would be able to work with later. So when I took this photograph, I, I thought I'm gonna do something with this. And the original, I don't think we have a picture of, but basically it's just a cement wall and it's got five blobs of, of cement on it that you know, are, are sort of three-dimensional. So a little bit of shadow. And then I digitally uh, cropped the picture and flipped it and turned it in all different directions. And, so we have 10 different tiles here that also can be flipped. So there's, there's this process within the uh, digital production, you could say, and also after the, the uh, metal tiles were made and laid out. And what's the L shape? 
I like the all shape because I thought it, it looked visually um, the best and it kind of sequentially made sense to me. But I also look at the L and it stands for life. Or lung. <laughs> or lung, yeah. Okay. All right. So this one, this sort of brings everything you're doing together. It's got some bigger shapes that look like the wall. It's got the smaller things that look like some of the details. So what's, what's going on here? Well, this picture originated where I live on the MGM lot um, in Culver City, where there's a lake. And so we, we call that Rain Tree Lake. And I sit out on a bench very often and relax. In fact, when we spoke on the phone yesterday, that's where I was. And I took one picture of some ducks on the lake. And I've taken hundreds of pictures there over the years. I've been there 30 years. And that's where I take most of those flower photos that you've seen on, on Instagram. So I look back at this, this one photo and I began to play with it. And I began to abstract it and do what I did with the, the pillow series where I just went in on, on one part of it. And so I had uh, an image that would be just a single image of that part of the lake, but then I, I did, uh, it's a complex process. I do all on the iPhone or on the iPad. I don't use Photoshop, this is all Apple. And so I take pictures of pictures of pictures. So the smallest ones are just a combination of the larger ones that are shrunk down. And then this, laid out in many different ways, just like the other pieces, I decided to go with this because, well, there were a couple of reasons. With interstitial lung disease, there's honeycombing of the, of the lungs, and this is a honeycomb shape. And I just thought the composition worked the best this way. So we were talking on the phone, and I was saying to you that I, I think your work is better now than before. Thank you. And the same thing with our last artist too, that there was something about almost the restrictions of the illness that pushed you to think, like you've got honeycombing in your lungs, so you're making honeycomb art that, as opposed to before, even though the travel photos and the street scenes were nice, I think, this shows a different level of thought, a different level of, so do you ever look at your illness and think, wow, there, this is a, some positive stuff came out of this for my art? I do, yeah. I mean, besides for my art, I think when we know we have a, a short period of time somewhere, we really make the best of it. Like when I went to London for graduate school, I was, trying to you know, get every last drop of experience out of that. And that's what I'm doing in my life now, even with coughing and tiredness. And making my art is my, next to my uh, favorite thing to do other than being with friends and family. All right, well, since, since the doctor has not been able to show up, you're gonna get a bunch of the doctor's questions. Okay. So when you went to him, how did you, you know, someone says to you, your, your, your lungs are failing. So emotionally, what was that like? Was that terrifying? Was that just, okay, I'll deal with it? And then how did you put your team together? How did you put your care together, your care team together? And what were you looking for? So for the, the med students here, what, what were you looking for them to supply you? It was such a long journey getting to the point where I... I found out what my disease is. And I have to step back and tell you a little story because it, it's so interesting. Um, I saw all these pulmonologists and I saw my primary care doctor. I asked for the notes from the different doctors so I would have them to give to the surgeon for the uh, lung biopsy. When I got those notes sent to me, Right there in ink on the page, it said interstitial lung disease. 
And even uh, on the same page, pulmonary fibrosis, question mark. And that had been written down and, and never stated or never said to me at all. So I, I actually could have been told I had this disease, I think about a year and a half before I got diagnosed. And if, if things had been done correctly, I would have been given a high resolution lung scan instead of a lung biopsy and they could have diagnosed it right away. So there are a lot of mistakes along the way. And so who, so who made those, were they? Those mistakes were made by my primary care doctor and pulmonary doctors before I got to USC. And did you guys have a face-to-face -face afterward of you saying, why didn't you tell me this? No, I never did. I mean, I just had to move on because my health was at risk. And who else on your team? Do you, you, do you have a whole team now? You've got assistants. Yeah. You've got, so what, what's involved in keeping you healthy enough to get you to the lung transplant either sooner or later? Well, about a year and a half ago, a uh, therapist who I speak with about every two weeks had said to me that I might qualify to get some aid in the home. And she put me in touch with an agency, and she was right. I was able to get that. And so it started out with about maybe 10 or 15 hours a week. And over time, it, it, it increased because my condition was getting worse. And I was up to about 50 hours a month um, up until November of this year, or last year. And what do they do for you? They do everything from helping me get up in the morning to helping me get dressed, preparing breakfast, cleaning up, getting the house cleaned up, um, walking the dog for me sometimes, or walking with me and the dog and going shopping, and just about everything I need. So you're talking about getting up in the morning. Is it a, is it from laying down all night or your lungs more clogged in the morning? I'm trying to get a sense of what this illness is doing to you. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say my lungs are necessarily more clogged, but I'm on a, I use a CPAP machine at night, so that helps with that. And that was also something they figured out through all this, these tests that I needed. But I can get to bed really quickly at night, but I have a very hard time getting up in the morning. And so my caregivers have the combination to my lock, and they come in, and they get some tea made for me, and they bring it up, because I have to start with my inhaler a half an hour before I eat. And so there's a whole process that goes on. And so once they're there with me and we're talking, I'm up. But if nobody came, even if I had an alarm clock going off, it would probably just keep ringing. So for our med students here, if, oh, Dr. Rao is here, okay. Okay, so I'll ask you the question I'm just gonna ask her. We had talked about when she first landed up in your office. So people with, with this kind of condition, what usually gets them to you? And then we're, like in her case, you met with her and then directed her to other people. So what, you, what are the first symptoms? What, what do you want to tell the, the students that are here to look for? So I think this picture sort of sums up what pulmonary fibrosis is. And I want to applaud you for how you're able to depict such a complex illness in a very... Um, uh, and I apologize, I'm using this term, but pathological image. Uh, you know, in medical school, we're taught that a lung is this sort of sponge, and it's this uh, bubbles that are coming together that are spherical in nature and so forth. And in pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease, this is what we see at the uh, granular level in the lung, how it goes from this uh, the bubbles in a bubble bath, how they're all spherical and bubbly and uh, you can see through the bubbles and so forth to in an interstitial lung disease where you see this angles 
that are sharp. And the angles are sharp because the interface between the alveoli, the cells that make up the lung, are being distorted and becoming fibrotic. Okay. So this is a great summation of what pulmonary fibrosis is and what interstitial lung disease does. Majority of the time when people come to see a pulmonologist, it's for shortness of breath, cough, uh, inability to do what they're usually able to do. Uh, you know, walking through the streets of Havana, Cuba, that requires a lot of energy and a lot of respiratory reserves to be able to huff and puff and get from one point to another point. When that changes from, well, I can't get from here to the top of the auditorium. People notice that. Uh, and it's like, I was able to do that. And that usually brings people to medical attention. One of the complexities of interstitial lung disease is that it's relatively new in the medical world, in the lung world. You know, it's been around for about 20 to 30 years and we're just starting to understand what is happening to the lung and how to treat that. And one of the great difficulties that a physician has is to be able to discuss a diagnosis that may not have a treatment. Uh, and that barrier is something that physicians have to deal with and overcome their own fear of letting someone down when they're coming to you as uh, someone that has knowledge, that has answers to a situation, that expects you to resolve this catastrophic event that's occurring in their life. Um, and to sit on the other side and look at someone and say, I don't have a treatment option for you. And this is a progressive illness that's going to progress. And this is what it foretells or what we foresee for this illness. We're unfortunately at a point where you're able to walk up to the end of the auditorium, but come six months, a year from now, you may not be able to go down these stairs either. Okay, And that's a, a great burden and a great challenge that um, physicians have to deal with. So that sort of goes right into the last question I was going to ask you anyway. So you've got to, along with giving a diagnosis, you've got to talk about long-term care for people, um, changes in ability. I would think family dynamics. I don't, actually don't even know if you're married, but there, there's got to be a difference in one person has to start taking care of somebody else and transplants and death. I mean, that's sort of, so they can walk into you with just having a little trouble breathing and then all this stuff is on the table. And I think one of the things that helps people along that is that understanding that this is a path and that with chronic illness like interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis, it requires a team approach and an understanding that occurs every step of the way. Where are we now? What do we need to do next? What are the options that are available? Um, and one of the things that has come out in the last 10 to 15 years is multidisciplinary approach to chronic illness or illnesses that uh, span uh, a multitude of years or decades. Um, you know, it's a a concept that started off uh, in other areas, such as congenital heart disease or uh, sickle cell disease or cystic fibrosis, and has gone into this concept from a pediatric span of life to adult, uh, young adult, uh, adolescent and young adult, and to adulthood. And that concept is now also going forward in adult medicine and saying, well, you may have an illness that starts at age 50, but we know that this, adult, this diagnosis or this illness can span up to 70 to 80 years. How are we going to accommodate and 
pivot to allow someone to function the best they can and have the most um, fruitful and meaningful life that they can. Uh, so that's where we're at. Before, we almost have to wrap up, so if any, I'm gonna ask you one more question, but in the meantime, if anybody has any questions for either of these two, uh, Dr. Schaff has a microphone, I think. Uh, Can I ask a question? Sure. I, I think you asked this question, but I wanna try to ask it in, in a slightly different way. After the diagnosis, the first pictures that I saw were um, more, to me, it looked like more spontaneous and more um, not necessarily structured in a way, but uh, what you saw, what you felt. And in the second set of uh, photographs I saw were much more crafted and manipulated at the end. Do you think that was a, a manifestation of the illness and not being able to do it spontaneously and having to sit down and do things? Um, sorry. Yes, and also a manifestation of COVID because I was restricted to my own environment. Interestingly enough though, I had thought about making objects with my photographs quite a long time ago, but had never done it. So I was finally afforded the time and the opportunity, especially knowing I had a show coming up and that I was gonna show new work and I, I didn't really wanna show just paper photographs anymore. I, I feel like I've, I've sort of outgrown that stage. Not to say there's a lower and a higher hierarchy here, but I had been there and done that, so I was ready for something new. And my last question goes to the doctor, which is always the last question I ask. How'd you pick this specialty? <laughs> what, what made you interested in this? Um. I, this was, believe it or not, pulmonary was my pulmonary medicine was my second choice. Uh, my first choice was hematology oncology, uh, and uh, I was. Now I'm really dating myself here. Um, I was in training during the height of the AIDS epidemic in the uh, late '80s, early '90s, uh, early 2000s, and. Uh, I was post-call and taking care of an individual who had acute HIV. Uh, the duty hours at that point in 1998, 97, 98, there wasn't this duty hour restriction. So uh, post-call at uh, 8.30, 9 o'clock at night, I was calling my attending saying, um, you know, those of you that know Dr. Singer would understand this story. Dr. Singer, our endocrinologist, calling him as a medicine attending saying, I wanna to talk to you about patient X who I'm seeing here. I, I'm running out of options here. Can you think of anything else that I should be doing as my attending? Uh, because I, I really am hitting a wall as to where I can go uh, in taking care of him. He said, first of all, Prush, what are you doing there? It's nine o'clock, your post call, you should have been home at least by five o'clock when the day was over. I said, no, I just didn't wanna finish. I wanted to make sure I had everything covered here. And he said, no, you know, unfortunately this is the acute HIV and this is what we have and we don't have any options at this point. Uh, unfortunately, I, I think you've done everything and there's nothing else. I went home, uh, my wife was waiting for me and she said, you were supposed to be home a couple hours ago, you know, what's going on? I told her the story and she, she's a smart woman uh, because she agreed to marry me, but that's different. Um, and then she said, well, you know, with hematology oncology, after I've accepted the uh, a position in hematology oncology, unfortunately, this is gonna be the majority of the patients that you see at some point or another, people are gonna pass away with this illness. Uh, and that struck me profoundly. I rethought about what my career choices were, uh, and I decided that I was gonna be an ICU doc because at least 50% of the people walk out of the ICU. 
So instead of an 80 to 80 to 90 percent uh, mortality rate, there was at least a 50-50 chance, and I was going to uh, see people walk out of the ICU. After I finished my uh, fellowship, um, my mentor, uh, Dr. Shapiro, pulled me aside and said, you should go into cystic fibrosis. I said, well, I, I appreciate it, but uh, I, don't, I just learned a little bit during fellowship. He goes, you have the personality that would work well with cystic fibrosis with young adults and so forth. So I went into cystic fibrosis. Somewhere along the line, um, I realized that not everything revolves around cystic fibrosis and the whole lung should be taken care of and not just a small segment. And uh, now I sort of expanded back to becoming a general pulmonologist again. All right. Well, I guess I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you for running over. We know you got. I'm sorry, stuck I'm late. I'm sorry, I'm late. It was you, great to have you here. Great Caroline. explanation. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us, Carolyn, and for sharing your artwork. Thank you, Dr. Rao, for coming, and thank you, Ted, as always. Thank you.